So without further ado, uh, Father Harry Pappas. I want to emphasize uh, at the outset how important for us of, of whatever faith background we come from, that real committed study of the sources of our faith, the traditions of our faith, and the development of our faith are for us. And that we can never underestimate how enriching it will be for us to apply our minds through our hearts to focusing on what is most important in life. Now, from the Christian confession, we, our confession is that is the Holy Trinity, the one God known and revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want to also say at the outset of this, please, let's make sure that we have in, in, in front of us the apostolic community wrote the story of Jesus, not as some, someone who simply is present taking notes when events happen and writing them down, but later, and in fact, since we have no record of Jesus writing anything, except maybe scrawling once in the dirt, all of what they heard, all of what they experienced was remembered. And in particular, we have a real good understanding in scholarship, in some ways, probably better now than in a long time, that these gospel records uh, stretched out in their finished form over decades and were absolutely influenced by the shattering experience of the first Christian believers in the crucifixion of Jesus as the Messiah which completely broke the mold for any expectation, the bodily resurrection of the Messiah in the midst of history, which also broke the mold of common expectations, the ascension of that Messiah, leaving the domains of time and space that confine us, and finally the outpouring of a spirit that then enabled the apostolic community to understand, to deeply interpret to realize this is who Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, really is. So the Old Testament is the raw material out of which they did this. They didn't just invent words, phrases, and such. Everything came out of this raw material of the Old Testament, the Scripture. This is, and this is why we've, we're going to find so many things related in the specific topic of Eucharist from the Old Covenant. And I start with Genesis because this is critical for us to realize. All of life, the creation, in a biblical worldview is sheer gift and grace from the outset. It is not an accident. It is not inevitable. It didn't have to be. It was simply graced and gifted. And that grace and gift was from chesed. God's self-giving love, faithfulness, and fidelity to his creation first. And it's good for us to conceive of creation, the cosmos itself, as a temple. As a temple in which the one true God creator comes to, chooses to create the cosmos as a place for him to dwell within. Not something completely apart, but being transcendent and imminent right there within this cosmos so he could share his love and his life with all of creation, all of the cosmos, as well as planet Earth and human beings. People, people are image bearer. Every This was an extraordinary claim, faith claim in the ancient world. It wasn't just the people at the top of the pecking order, pharaohs and kings and leaders, but every human being was a reflection of that one true God. That's extraordinary. No other faith community was making anywhere near that claim in the ancient Near East out of which this literature comes. Humanity is created, and here I'm going to deliberately use this kind of language. We see human beings as priests of God's creation, not because they're walking around with robes or vestments, but they have a priestly vocation to work the creation that God has given them to produce the fruits thereof, 
to offer them back to God for his blessing in thanksgiving for his creation. That priestly vocation is inherent in every human being's life. Then next, Exodus, very, very quickly. The great deliverance from slavery in Egypt through Moses. Here, here, the entire primal event of deliverance is accompanied by a meal, the Passover meal, directed by God through Moses with specific commands that were given to how it's to be done, when it's to be done, an ordered way of life that is liturgical. So all life is actually has rituals and rhythms to it. So it's no surprise that Torah, the foundational text of the ancient community of faith committed to God, had lots of instructions for how to worship him, how to pray before him, how to offer sacrifice. And Leviticus, the third book, is the book filled with all those instructions. And they're minute in detail, and oftentimes modern readers will fall asleep if you try to read this book at night, or get bored out of your minds if you want to try to read it in the middle of the day when you're fresh. But it shows us a worldview that builds upon Genesis, that our life of faith, faithfulness to the one creator God is built upon offering back a portion of what God has given in the first place. So for Texas A, for agriculture, I got good news for you. Boy, Texas A and M fits within that ordered creation of God. He's very concerned about the natural products of the earth that he has given to us, what we do with them. Death of animals were involved, but the death wasn't of ultimate importance in the sacrifices. It's what happened when the life-giving blood of the animal was then sprinkled or shed or placed upon an altar or people or some other function that God had indicated for this to be used. All the sacrifices were occasions of great joy, including praise and reverence, thanksgiving. Texans simply are way too familiar with barbecues to realize that in the world God gave all of these instructions, having a barbecue of good meat was a rare event. Rare event. So when people sacrifice lambs and goats and other animals, oh, everybody was looking forward to it. Whenever it would happen, a few times a year, because then now the animals weren't just there to help produce uh, milk and cheese and all kinds of other good things for life. Now we could really have some great barbecue right at the temple, right at the tabernacle, right at the sanctuary where these things happened. Cakes were baked out of the grain of the, of the world, made into flour and produced. Uh, those types included burning up the whole animal, a holocaust. More to the point, beginning with grain sacrifices, even an important early Christian witness, not long after the Bible, the New Testament, just in the martyr in the second century, makes this remark. Offerings of fine choice flour, precisely one of those seven main sacrifices in Leviticus, were prescribed to be presented on behalf of those who had been cleansed from leprosy, the great ancient disease that everybody feared. It was actually a designation of a whole host of different conditions that medicine might diagnose today. And was, he goes on to say, was a type of bread of Eucharist, the celebration which our Lord Jesus Christ prescribed in remembrance of the suffering which he endured on behalf of those who are purified in the soul from all iniquity. So Justin sees this as a type, a grain offering, not passive, just a grain offering, as a type of something that fits, fits within how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. After all, he came to fulfill all of Torah, all of Scripture, not to do away with it, as in fact, some of his detractors accused him of doing. Communion meals. This is important. All these meals were a way in which the people would dine and celebrate and feast in the presence of God specifically. These were not just, just to be done at home. These sacrifices were at a common public shrine, evolving over years to the great temple that Solomon 
had built. And then thanksgiving is a theme throughout the Old Testament story. It is, in fact, I would say it's even more primal than the Old Testament story. Thanksgiving would be the most significant byproduct of the first Bible, long before the second Bible, the Bible that we're used to, uh, Old Testament, New Testament. The first Bible in the great vision of the Christian church is creation, the created order. We would now say billions of years before the Bible we know was written. And in the first creation, as David and the Psalms make clear, where all creation is called to praise and glorify God, the first thing a hydrogen atom coming out of the Big Bang did was, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because when you've been created by a God of love and truth, what else... Do you need to say, it's not yours, it's not ours, it belongs to someone else, graciously given to us. Thanksgiving is natural to creation and then becomes embedded in the revealed truth of the scripture because salvation is an extraordinary gift, the same gift we sometimes tend to think, some a little too simplistically, that the law of the Old Testament was legalistic and oppressive and all these kinds of things Jesus came to say from that, the actual track record, if you look at it, is a bit different from that. The law and the commandments were given by God because he already saved his people by grace through faith in the Exodus. The commands, all those commands are given afterwards where God says, okay, now you got this great gift of being saved from oppression in Egypt. Here's now how I'd like you to live in positive response to who I am and what I do. This is the proper way to see it. And finally, with forgiveness. Well, forgiveness is evidence plenty in the Old Covenant, particularly what's important for the topic tonight, is the prayer of King Solomon at the dedication of the first temple in Jerusalem. And I quote here that, when your people pray toward this place, O Lord, hear from heaven and forgive and bring them again to the land that you gave to their ancestors. Already, he's anticipating exile that's going to come centuries later. Though the temple becomes the place of forgiveness through liturgical worship set up by the Creator Lord, the Savior Lord through the Torah, the law, established in the Promised Land by Solomon, renewed by Ezra and Nehemiah, and incredibly elaborated and beautified by Herod the Great. Now, we get to the Passover. This liturgy, Paschal liturgy, of sacrifice for all time is in Exodus 12. It consists of the night before they're to be delivered of these basic elements. Choose an unblemished male lamb for each household. That's one year old. Why is a year old important? Well, I learned something when I was on pilgrimage to Ireland last year. Uh, until a lamb is one year old, it's not a sheep yet. Because at one, then you start calling it a sheep because it's mature. It's an adult. It's grown up. So you want a mature lamb that's to be offered. Perfect. No, no defects. Not maim, not lame or diseased. Two, you sacrifice the lamb, originally done by all members of the community on their own. In other words, the father of each household what we would now call in the New Testament kingdom of faith, the royal priesthood of God, a priestly act done by the father of each household originally, later restricted to the tribe of Levi, only after the mass idolatry and faithlessness of the golden calf incident. When they're waiting for Moses, dallying on Mount Sinai, and Aaron gets involved doing all kinds of terrible things involved with the people that are there. Then the third thing, you spread the blood of the lamb on entrees of home as a visible sign or sacrament of the sacrifice to stain the wood of the doorposts as a permanent sign to alert the destroying angel to pass over the homes of God's chosen elect people. And you should note common method by which the, the lambs were killed. Their throats were slit, blood drained into a sacred vessel, Priests then carried that blood to the altar and poured it on the sacrifice. That spreading of that sprinkling of the blood was done with a plant called hyssop. 
Anybody who's ever been on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land knows there is such a plant, and it is, has distinctive characteristics that make it good for doing precisely this sort of thing. Wood, blood, and hyssop all will occur in the sacrifice of Jesus, and that's no accident. And finally, you're supposed to eat the flesh of the lamb, repeated for emphasis. And what's important here, to go back, is not the death of the victim, but the communion that results through the animal that has been sacrificed, through the material elements for being restored to coming into a common union with the Lord. And finally, the Passover is to be kept as a day of remembrance. Deuteronomy, the final book of Torah, sets up a dynamic still followed throughout the ages in traditional Christian worship in which once for all saving events are never repeated when you celebrate Passover. They're simply brought into the present. They're made present through the gathering of the people of God, which is an extraordinary graced moment of the community. So every time, for example, Passover is celebrated amongst Jews to this day or Eucharist for Christians, we're not repeating anything. We're not duplicating anything. We're simply participating, experiencing again and again the once and for all event that originally happened. That's the contribution of Deuteronomy to this. Now in the New Testament, sacrifices in the temple. It's very clearly. All the people are, uh, come from all over on pilgrimage for the greatest of the three annual feasts to converge. Most likely, all the evidence points, it was a Jewish Seder meal, a, a Hebrew word simply meaning order, prescribed order to be done. Uh, in the temple, in homes, this, but the temple sacrifice ended with the temple being destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. There's a curious detail that comes up both in Jewish tradition, outside of the Old Testament, but uh, written, attested by another great Christian witness, Justin the Martyr, in a dialogue that he once had with a very prominent Jewish man, and listen to these words. The mystery then of the lamb which God enjoined to be sacrificed as the Passover was a type of Christ, with whose blood in proportion to their faith in him they anoint their houses, that is themselves, who believe in him. And that lamb which was commanded to be wholly roasted was a symbol as a suffering of the cross which Christ should undergo. For the lamb, which is roasted, is roasted and dressed up in the form of a cross. Now, why would he say that? Listen to this. For when the lamb is sacrificed, the priests take one spit and drive it through the shoulders for the arms. They take the other spit and drive it through the middle of the body up to the skull, forming the cross, is what he says. Another typos, another type. The, the people it, it, partake of this feast, this extraordinary feast. There is a, a variety of cups of wine that are offered. There are questions that are asked by the son. Why is it different, different from others? The father of the household tells the story of the excess, uh, going all the way back to Patriarch Abraham. There is an active participation of families in the once and for all event. But also some Jewish traditions connected the Passover feast with the eventual coming of the Messiah, the long-awaited deliverer who would be in the lineage of David and deliver God's people from their enemies, from their oppressors. And here, you should note, a great uh, a Latin father of the church, Jerome, once attested to this, that in his writing he notes that the Messiah, according to some Jews, will come at midnight according to the manner in Egypt from the first Passover. Because the Jewish tradition also thought that when the Messiah shows up, it will be the dawn of the age to come. Now that's very technical Hebrew language. In, in the Hebrew vision, the Old Testament vision of life, there are only two ages in which the human race lives. One is the present age. The present age is an age 
that is fundamentally good, blessed, and holy by God, but also wounded, broken, and fractured by the misuse of human free will. The second age, the age to come, is the age that the Messiah will, will, will inaugurate. It will be the age that will not be characterized by the second part of the present age, but only by the redeemed, fully perfected first part, goodness, holiness, virtue, love, truth, justice, meekness, righteousness, and every other positive characteristic that we can draw from the scriptures. Jesus comes along, and what does he do? He celebrates what appears to be Passover Seder, me, especially in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he does some of the same things every leader would do, except when you get to the part in the meal of talking about Abraham and Moses, what does Jesus do? He starts talking about himself and what he's about to undergo and what he is to do, take, eat, this is my body, this is my blood, which is shocking news to anybody in the first century. And very definitely, if we were in the apostolic community on that same night, we'd all be going, say what? Uh, what, did, what did he say? What, what happened to Abraham? What about Moses? What about Egypt? What's going on here? What's the deal? What is this business? Uh, Jesus acts as the host, and oddly enough, Jesus offers himself as the menu. You ever been to a restaurant like that before? Well, welcome to the Christian community of faith. Jesus kept the Passover, but deliberately and decisively altered it and gave his instructions to be carried on. He saw himself as the new Passover lamb, sacrificed the inauguration of a new exodus, Established a new covenant, a, providing a new temple, we'll see that in a minute, and a new covenant meal. Second part, manna. This relates to the story way back uh, also in the book of Exodus. The people of God have been delivered from slavery in Egypt. And because the people of God typically do this, when they leave behind something that's secure and stable and everything's good and fine and so forth, now they find them in the risk-taking business of freedom. Which is, a, which is much more scary than being a slave, where you know everything's perfectly under control, even if it's not ideal conditions. They murmur and grumble at Moses because they're not getting great food they enjoyed in Egypt. And so what does God do? He provides two things for them through Moses. This is the way the story goes. First, in the morning, there is a dew-like flake substance fine as, quote, hoarfrost, and the people go manhu, which is in Hebrew, what is it? Not very complicated, is it? So, uh, they, it becomes known as mana. It's simply an alliteration that from a, a basic question that becomes now a noun. It's not ordinary bread. It's considered, in fact, miraculous. In the evening, quails. Oh, you get to eat some good protein if you're not so crazy about some of the carbs first thing in the morning. And later in the Psalm, Psalm 90, this manna is termed the bread of angels. What does Jesus do with this? In the Gospel of John, this is what he does. There's a conversation in chapter 6 that's most perplexing. In fact, his conversation drove away most of the people that followed him. And the Gospel account's pretty honest about that. Most of the people after this stopped following him. This has to do with context. Beginning the chapter, he's feeding 5,000 in the desert. The Jews begin to think, maybe this guy could be the Messiah. Forces him to withdraw because they want to force him to be crowned, and he's not at all ready to do anything like that. Then, at some point, they seek and demand a sign. Okay, perform for us, Jesus. You're so great. Yeah, show us now. So, we want manna from heaven, right in the story. Uh, Jesus provides an understanding of himself being the bread of life. And this is the part that, of course, becomes so shockingly and disturbing to, the, to people. 
unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. It's hard to imagine a phrase coming out of a first century Jewish rabbi more shocking and disturbing than that, because good Jews were forbidden to drink blood from any kind of animal. And how in the world are they going to be drinking the blood of a human being? And the reason they weren't allowed, quote from Leviticus, the life of the flesh, the life of an animal, is in the blood. And I, the Lord said, I've given it to you to make atonement for your lives on the altar. For as life, it's the blood that makes atonement. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood, nor shall any alien who resides among you eat blood. And the irony here is, that's exactly why Jesus says you need to drink it. Because the life is found in the blood that he will sacrifice. Third, Passover, manna and now bread of presence. Bread of presence, what in the world is that? After the, in the first stipulations for setting up the tabernacle and the worship under Moses, because after you get all the commandments in Exodus, now you're into the tabernacle, the first tent, and how worship, all the details about how worship is supposed to be set up, what you do, how you make this, so forth. And there's a table, there's a table there, that in which is going to be placed the bread quote, of face or presence, literally in the Hebrew. It's lachem hapanim. I mean, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's pretty clear. Uh, it, the bread, but whose face, whose presence? The one true Savior, the one true Creator and Savior God. Moses builds the ta t table right after the heavenly banquet that he and the elders have on Sunday. Listen to this language in Exodus chapter 24. There they are, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders. They go up on the mountain, Sinai. They saw the God of Israel. That's, that's unusual language, because the scripture is very clear. No one's ever seen the one true God and can live. They saw the God. Under his feet, there was something like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. That's pretty common language in apocalyptic visions of prophets like Zechariah. And then it goes on to say, God, there's this meal. God did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people as they're eating and feasting in his presence. Also, they beheld God and they ate and drank. It's a memorial banquet of astonishing in intimacy with God. Jesus, what does he do with this business? Well, in Matthew chapter 12 on the Sabbath, He's, wa he's walking around in his itinerant ministry. The, the disciples start plucking heads of grain. It's kind of an odd story. The Pharisees are uh, not pleased at all because they're doing this on the Sabbath day. And Jesus explains why they can do it by referring to an incident involving King David and his military men in his guerrilla army of when they were hungry and they needed something to eat. They come across the tabernacle. There's nothing else to eat. And they go in and they eat this bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. But David and his men are allowed to eat this. And Jesus goes on to say, have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath by doing their work and yet are guiltless? I tell you something greater than the temple is here. Jesus goes on to claim the temple itself is a type of who Jesus is in his person. Finally, wine, wine of the supper. There's a, 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 in a, in a Seder meal, there are more than one a cup of wine that are offered. A first cup for sanctification, Kiddush. A second cup, Haggadah, for proclaiming the meaning of the night in the off offering thanks. The third cup, at the eating of the meal of the Passover lamb with unleavened bread, a standard blessing. And this is the, uh, the, the cup of Beracha, the blessing that's offered. And a, even a fourth cup at the, after everything's been concluded. So, curiously enough, the one gospel that does not have a Last Supper is the Gospel of John. So what does John do? Well, he does something Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't do. There is no Last Supper on the day of, of the Passover because Jesus is with his disciples the evening before the Passover starts, and that lengthy farewell address chapters 13 
to 17. And in, 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 the, in the context of this, we have something happening that's quite unusual. Uh, so along with the passion report of the, of the other gospels, it's, it's very clear. One, Jesus in his prayer of Gethsemane prays that this cup, not just doesn't talk about the suffering that's coming up, talks about it as a cup. Let this cup pass from me. Now already in Luke, there are at least two cups involved in the Last Supper. We don't know of any more that he may have in mind. Let this cup pass from me. And then, however, on Golgotha, as he's crucified, he's offered wine to drink mixed with gall, but he wouldn't drink it, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But what happens in John? Well, in John's report, he actually asks for a cup of wine and drinks it before he expires. And he's given the wine with, on a branch of hyssop after the cross of wood has been stained with his blood. So even though in John's gospel, this is not a, there's no Passover meal, is this John's way of saying how the mystery of salvation as a whole has been concluded by the final wine, the, the, the cup of Hallel, the cup of praise and glory to God, that in now the kingdom has arrived because the Passover that includes the crucifixion and the resurrection now takes place. And then uh, one other note from the Song of Songs. Now this might find odd, but for all hot-blooded young people, if you don't know the Song of Songs in the Old Testament, you got to read it. Because if you can read that with a straight face, you're not human. It's an erotic love poetry over eight chapters between a man and a woman. And if you're not embarrassed looking at some of that stuff, or at least think, oh, uh, you know, gee, I don't know if mom and dad uh, know I'm reading this kind of stuff. Uh, it, but look, it, it's not pornography. It's, it's the extraordinary expression of erotic intimacy between human beings. Now, my point of saying this is, this book of intimacy has both been understood on the physical level of sexuality and marriage, without a doubt, Judaism and Christianity, there's no question about that, but also intimacy of prayer between people and God. And if anybody thinks, I've been married over 41 years, you're not going to be able to fool me on this one, young people, and anybody else around here. If anybody here wants to claim to me that sexual intimacy is the greatest intimacy, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's all I got to tell you. Because the intimacy between, that's simply a reflection of the powerful, substantive, visible, invisible intimacy that God wants to have with every human being and with the community of people as a whole that is led by his covenant community to this day. The once for all salvation event of love and history that's worked out on a large level in Exodus, Passover, is worked out on the, on the level of the personal in Song of Songs. And I would say, based on the Song of Songs, true love is not blind. In fact, it's the opposite. Crucified, long-suffering, resurrected love is the only love that sees straight. Every other love doesn't see the whole picture, doesn't see the depths of human beings, doesn't see the depths of community or university or society or family. And I'll finally, I'll try to, to end on this. Uh, what, what, what in the world uh, could this mean for us? Well, I, my conviction is it means a whole lot more than normally we, we realize. Grains and grapes given in gratitude. Human beings as the royal priesthood of creation. We are the priesthood of, of God, the King, the Creator God, manifested through His Son by His Spirit. We're the ones given. We're the ones given the land, the agriculture, the world to work in its most elemental sense, farming, baking, and processing wine, and then offering back those gifts back to God in gratitude. Natural elements of ancient or Eastern culture, widespread and abundant, 
still to us. Fundamental is sacrifice and offering to gift for the sheer gift of life. And I would submit to you, the real enemy of thanks, of giving thanks to God and being grateful to God is not so much ingratitude, at least not for people on the inside in the incommunicated faith. I would say the real enemy, and it's a serious one, is taking it for granted. Taking it for taking every breath for granted, taking every moment for granted, taking every person for granted. Every experience, every day, every week, every year. That's the real enemy of Thanksgiving. The ancient Hebrew covenant of Passover and manna and bread of presence, the new Christian covenant of Passover and manna bread. The shocking, scandalous, and strange fulfillment of the Old Testament story through the crucified Messiah, who is defeated and killed by the supposed enemies of God's people, rather than coming into defeat and kill them. A resurrected body that plops down in the middle of history somewhere, and not at the very end. The introduction of the new age, and even more extraordinary and mind-blowing, the incarnation of the one true God who creates and redeems with a new commandment. An intimacy, the most profound intimacy. And here, a monk of Manathos once pronounced this. Great ascetic, skinny as a rail, spends his lifetime in prayer and fasting and scripture and, and, uh, and works of mercy and, and obedience and community, talks about receiving communion in liturgy as Christ making love to him. The purpose of this, transform us into vessels of the Lord of creation, history, salvation, called to extend that revolutionary movement of love and truth to the world as we await the return in glory. As with all of these great manifestations of God, and I submit to you, the Eucharist is greater than Moses at the burning bush. And this is why in the Coptic Orthodox Church, still to this day out of the Near East and other Eastern cultures, they don't walk into a church with their shoes on, take their shoes and their sandals off. Because the place they're going into, what they're going to do is on holy ground, no less than when God told Moses, take off your sandals. The place where you're standing is holy ground. As with all of these, we need to relearn trembling, Holy trembling. And the common meal, boy, does this, this great intimacy is not individualistic. It doesn't come per whatever we all sort of do separately, independently, together. It's an absolute community activity. Still to this day in the Christian East, a priest cannot just celebrate a liturgy unless there's at least one other person there to do it with him. Because Jesus did actually say, quite specifically, where two or three are gathered, they are in their midst. Which doesn't mean he can't be with us in isolation. But he's emphasizing his most powerful presence and greatest intimacy with us in community and communion. And just like we don't get to pick our brothers and sisters in our own national families, we're not going to be able to get, pick them out either in our family of faith. And this gratitude, I tell you, I tell you, this has struck me so powerfully. It is easier to fast, prepare, and receive Eucharist regularly than to become a Eucharistic person who lives a Eucharistic lifestyle, giving thanks to God for all things, painful and pleasurable, regular and irregular, ordinary, extraordinary, giving thanks, giving thanks, giving. We are not, despite all of our advances, of material culture, of intellect, and on the verge of AI and all the other things, we're not in control. We're creatures, limited, finite creatures of an astonishingly great God. And I'll end with uh, two examples. of people celebrating Eucharist. They come from some time ago, but they've left an indelible imprint. 
It might as well have happened yesterday. I've spent uh, enough time on Monothos in Greece. It's kind of a rocky peninsula in northeastern Greece, and women haven't been allowed on there for a thousand years. Don't, don't throw me out of the room. I didn't make the rules. I'm just reporting them to you. And uh, it's been a it's been an extraordinary uh, large neighborhood of monastic communities, of men who, do, who choose not to be married and to give themselves completely to God in all kinds, pursuing particularly the inner life of communion with God in community. And one elder, his name is Emilianos, of the Monastery of Rock of St. Simon. It's called in Greek, Simonopetra. I happen to spend most of my time there for good reasons. They celebrate liturgy every day in this place every single day. And one day he happened to be there because he's in demand everywhere, preaching, teaching, hearing confessions. I mean, just an extraordinary figure. Uh, one day, I, I thank God I was there, when he celebrated, he was the chief celebrant in the liturgy. Now, <laughs> nobody had to school me. When I saw him celebrate the liturgy, it was like nothing I'd ever seen or heard of. There was a transcendent quality about it. I can't describe it in words. His voice, his face, his presence. In the midst of lots of vestments, candlelight and icons resonating, great men chanting, movement, all by led by his extraordinary presence in words. He was not overwhelming or overpowering. He was simply extraordinary. It was... It was, uh, if that wasn't the glory of God in the midst of mortals, I don't know what is. It was not something regular for him. And then from the Christian West, I happened to be at Yale University studying when Father Henry Nowen came for a visit. It was after he had taught there. I had introduced to him by one of my professors at seminary long before Father Joseph Allen, a blessed memory was my professor of pastoral care. Henry and I, I, I had read and I would deeply respected him. He came to visit, uh, as he always did in all his travels, and he, he would send out notices to students and they'd all come together. And they, all would, they would go down to a little bitty plain crypt underneath Marquand Chapel, big, beautiful chapel on top of the Yale Divinity School. And there in the midst of just a couple of candles, a couple of icons, crowded in a little bitty space by friends and students. There was Henry in the middle. And all he had was a stole around his neck over plain clothes. Henry wasn't the best dresser. He was just an average guy. He looked like he'd just come out of the village. But when he led the mass, the simple style that comes out of the West, his presence the way he led it, the way he preached, the way he celebrated was extraordinary. I'd never seen or heard anything like that. Never, never heard from any of his people before that. My first experience with that, there was a passion. There was a simplicity. There was an unbelievable natural spirituality that was transformative. I don't think those two things are accidents. I think they are fruits of the Spirit, East and West, that show the reality, the overwhelming reality of Eucharist. It's based upon all the types of saving meal and products and people and priesthood and community and commandment of the Old Covenant, fulfilled, enriched, enlivened, and transfigured in the New. All given to us for the forgiveness of sins and abundant life here and now as we live in the middle, still in the midst of the present age that's now been impacted by the age to come in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you. So how often you like you know you uh, refer us to practice communion or Passover or Eucharist? 
So how many times we have to do in a year or like, uh, you know, what's the, uh, do we have any timeline for that? Or else it's like your repentance that you have to do or you have to like thank God each and every minute. So any uh, idea on that one? Well, since we don't have any clear mm -hmm. teaching directly from Christ, mm -hmm. We receive that from the apostolic community and their successors mm -hmm. as to how they lived. So we already read in the Acts of the Apostles, mm -hmm. there are multiple times every week the apostolic mm -hmm. community is getting together to break bread, mm -hmm. a technical language for celebrating Eucharist mm -hmm. in their midst. Very frequently in an era of house churches, Eucharist being celebrated around dinner in a dinner table, mm -hmm. all right, in the evening. Then when we move along further in the tradition of the church, we have St. Basil the Great in the fourth century, as we have now the church no longer is an illegal entity. Now it's part of, uh, uh, it's part of civil society. It's, it's okay, it can practice and grow on its own. And Basil is receiving Eucharist four times a week. It's very clear. And then parallel to what happens in the empire as uh, let's say zeal gradually wanes, because the world, worldly living, comes into play, uh, now you have a whole group of Christians saying, wait a second, people living in the world, we're going to be receiving it as often as possible, because we're not going to just slide by the way you're living a little too carefully as Christians, and they begin receiving communion at, in various different frequencies, but it's extremely important to their way of life, what we call the monastic movement, that really is based on Acts of the Apostles, on the, uh, on the example of sharing possessions, of living together, sharing together, relying together, and so forth and so on. And then you go into the church as it grows in history and you've got all different kinds of models, but in parish life today, uh, typically there'll be every Sunday, which is Easter, every Sunday is Easter, Easter is Pascha, for, is the celebration of, of the great Passover from death to life in Christ. And then uh, feast days uh, in parishes that'll come up for saints, for events in the life of Christ, things like this, and monasteries, depending on where they are and, how they're, and, and what kind of life is established, could either be daily like on Athos or could be less frequent. So it's, and the way people respond to this, well, that's a matter of growing in Christ Having someone, having someone to accountable to, growing in a community of faith, learning the community of faith, and applying yourself not to do what you want to do about receiving communion, but learning to do what God calls the whole group to do about receiving. That's another part of this whole thing. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. So you mentioned that um, a big part of this is remembering and being grateful for existence, the beauty of the joy in creation, and all that kind of comes with it. But an enemy to that is. Um, essentially having it become too, taking it for granted. Yes. How do you best think that you prevent against that, especially when you're taking it regularly and become something that can be fairly ritualistic or routine? Yes. Uh, I would say, I would start by saying to develop something that universities are not good at. And I'm not trying to pick on Texas A&M. Developing the inner life, the inner life, of interior prayer, of silence, of meditation. These are ancient practices that have been virtually lost in many ways in Western. Western society is in, much more involved in extrovert, act, do, speak, talk, produce, this kind of thing. The interior life is something very different. And the more, my personal opinion, the more we develop that interior life, and this is the way it's worked for me, and it it's, it's, takes practice. You got to learn from elders. You got to read. You got to practice. You stumble, stumble, stumble all the time. The more I develop that interior life, the less that the more I'm able to address falling asleep at the wheel. Not just driving, but you know, I mean, I don't mean literally. I just mean you know, zoning out, taking things for all that kind of stuff. All of that stuff blocks grace from working because we fall into these habits mind-numbing, heart-numbing habits, we don't come alive. And grace is about coming alive. Yeah. Is, does that help? So uh, maybe, well, maybe add, are there best practices? 
What are some good practices or simple everyday things you can do to start building into that? Sure. Okay. Well, I'll name two. Two that comes to the top of my head. The first is something called the Jesus Prayer. Maybe some of you have heard that. It's, a, it's developed in these great centers of prayer for centuries. It's now become more widely known in the Western world because of people writing about it, especially in English. And it says, it's a summary of the gospel in one short line. Lord, my, I say it this way. They're different variety. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Or, as I learned at a monastery in England, I love this. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Identifying myself with the world and not separating myself out as some, oh, I'm a righteous guy, you know, type thing. So that, memorizing that and using that's a great way to start. And then another way that I've learned is the practice of what's called centering prayer. Centering prayer, which is a, a, a deliberate practice of, of sitting alertly in the presence of God with certain techniques that you learn and practices in which it's beyond words, beyond emotions, which may seem kind of strange to most people, but it actually can happen where we learn to, we can't block anything out. Uh, as Isaac the Syrian says in the seventh century, the mind is like a wagon full of monkeys jumping up and down. Anybody who thinks they're gonna train the monkeys is delusional. You're not a circus genius. Forget, you're not gonna, you're not gonna train the monkeys. They're gonna be there the rest of your life. It's learning how to ignore the monkeys because underneath the monkeys is the stillness of God. And learning to abide in stillness, what's called isihia, silent stillness in, this, in these eight great ancient practices, that's another way, those two things. But they take some learning. It's good to learn with others who have experienced it and such, and not just read about it in a book, which university students like to do. Oh, I'm sorry, they, they read it on the internet. There are no books anymore. Thank you, Father, for your uh, speech this evening. And my question to you was, yeah. uh, could you go over that Seder meal that you were talking about and its yeah. relation to the Passover and how it connects to the Eucharist again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in the days of Jesus, there's some evidence, extra Judaic uh, evidence, uh, from, uh, let's say, beginning about the first century B.C. of a Seder meal. And a Seder meal has a specific order with certain, uh, certain actions that are done, foods that are prepared, wine, cups of wine that are produced, and such. And so that order is, uh, we, we, don't, we can't say it with 100% certainty, it seems to be the best evidence for how Passover was celebrated in the time of Jesus in the first century AD. And those details include you know, an appetizer uh, beforehand with a, with a cup of wine. And then the introduction of the, the son saying, why is this night so different from all their nights? And the head of the household, the father says, because Abraham, uh, Abraham our father, uh, uh, emigrated from Haran to the, to the promised land. Then he goes into the patriarchs, he goes into abbreviated form, to Moses, the exodus, the deliverance from uh, slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. And then there is a, another cup. Then there is a, a meal, the, the, the lamb that's been roasted, now is shared and eaten at the end of that, another cup. And then there's psalms that are prayed, specifically like Psalms 114, 116 that we know about, possibly a little bit later to 118, that are in which they finished, conclude the Passover meal. And then at the end of that is a final cup. So that's one piece of evidence about the Seder meal. Then and Seder meal is still very common today uh, amongst Jewish uh, all the Jewish people for Passover, and I, I can, and of course there are if you look there are actually even more details about it in contemporary Jewish practice depending on which variety of Judaism is involved. There are varieties of Judaism today, just as there were variety of Judaisms in the day of Jesus. It's not monolithic as we tend to think, but you can find a lot of more details than what I just provided about that as that's been carried to the, to the present. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. And by the way, that's why Luke is talking about more than one cup. People think, there's, no, there's more than one cup involved in this of wine. So I grew up Protestant, and yeah. the general understanding of the Eucharist, or of just you know, Christ's sacrifice in general, is that it, yeah. was a, it was a penal thing, right? 
And when we look at it in the light of the Old Testament sacrifices, there's relatively little, you know, language to support that theory, right? But there is at least some in St. Paul's that, you know, can provide grounds for this, you know, penal system. So it seems like there's a mixture of both at play here. So what's like the right balance to understanding the Eucharist in this sense? There are different ways of trying to interpret and express what's happening in Eucharist, what's happening in the cross and the resurrection. However, in the Eastern Christian tradition, there's a pretty clear movement over time that goes towards love. This is the long-suffering, crucified love of the one true God for his people. He'll go to nothing. He'll spare nothing to bring them back, to say, I want you. I want to be intimate with you. I want you for my own. I want to live in you, with you, for you. And I want you to live in and with and for me to carry out my purposes in this cosmos that I've that I've given. The, the issue, the, the accent on punishment or penal, a penal element is not pronounced. Yes, there is, yes, uh, Christ bears the cross for the sin of the world, large scale, the, the woundedness. I think woundedness for primal sin is better than brokenness because machines break. People are wounded. Humanity's wounded. Cosmos is wounded by the misuse of our free will. In that wounding, here comes the great physician. And he says, no, I'm not here to punish you because you're wounded. I'm here to heal you. You're sick. That's why Ignatius, a great early father in the fourth century, second century called it the medicine of immortality. It's a beautiful expression. The medicine of it. And I remember growing up, I didn't like medicines, especially the stuff they used to do. The amoxicillin I used to drink was this chocolatey stuff that made me gag. And I would hate it. But my mother said, you're taking it because you need it. So we did. Ugh, but it did us good. Does that help? So it, uh, healing, healing uh, of wounds, sickness. This is a good way for us. Uh, I, I think that's the, that's the prevailing way of looking upon this. I was interested in something that you said uh, that traditionally um, in the West, and I was, certainly was raised within a Western tradition, yeah, yeah. the sacrifice of Christ was what redeems us, and yeah. sacrifice is understood as his voluntary death on the cross. Yes. And but you seem to suggest that it wasn't the the death so much as the life of his blood that is then anointed on us with the idea that the, the Eucharist itself is the completion of the act of Christ's um of Christ's sacrifice or that that, w that in some sense the, the sacrifice of Christ is not complete until the blood is applied um Eucharistically um, to us, and when it is brought forward so that we can be partakers of it, and I, I, I'm, it was an, it was a novel idea to me. It was an interesting idea, and I, I was just wondering how how far you think you can carry that. Is that well, is that was that an implication, or is it? Am I just reading into what you're saying? How far I will take it will depend on the mind of the church, not on me, my little puny mind. But on the other hand, I would say it struck me as a consequence of looking at the Old Testament types that, uh, that the, 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 this communal meal is deeply embedded. This is the way after the sacrifice that the people participate, participate in what's happening. Now, of course, sometimes they've had the blood sprinkled on them. I'm not just eaten the uh, sacrificial meal. And that the and that and that I, by exchange I would say, if if in fact we could objectify broadly the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ that are seen in the East as two sides of one coin, if we could objectify that, I would say the subjective appropriation of that is Eucharist. It's not merely I oh Jesus saves me. 
This is, we, we come before him as needy, hungry, ready to receive. And then that crucified, risen flesh, the mystery of that, is provided to us for eternal life. Unless you eat my bread, eat, eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have no life in you kind of thing. Because if, if, the, if the cross is life-giving, well, then how do we participate in that? Is it just a mental thing? Is it a faith thing? Well, I would say yes, but it's completed in the meal thing. That's the point of what I'm trying to drive. Thank you. Thank you.